Saviv, the first question will be the inevitable one. 1983, you were motoring along. Have you ever thought about it this way? That you got out for 33, West Indies may have lost the game, India may have won the World Cup, but world cricket changed forever because you got out. Had you been there, you would have won the match for the West Indies. Nothing would have happened. No Indian fairy tale. Today, what we are seeing in terms of the IPL, the monetary revolution, everything was because one man, one man, Sir Isaac Vivian Alexander Richards, got out to Kapil Dev, that catch of Madan Lal for 33. Funny enough, before you got to 83, there was 79, and there was certainly 75 before that. True, but, but those were your years. I'll yeah. come to you. But <laughs> that one, one dismissal, I thought changed world cricket forever. Well, I guess, um, to be fair, it has taken uh, a leaf out of my book in the sense that Kapil Dev, who had been dying out for quite a long time after taking that particular catch, you know, it was such a, a catch. There's only one Indian, in my opinion, on that field that day would have taken that catch. And it just changed our whole lives. Uh, from, from one point, we were heroes, and we all came to zero at that time. You know, because to me, uh, India played a very good game. Uh, we weren't at our very best. But at the end of the day, um, you got to concede that for some reason, uh, India deserved that. Okay. If I could have some silence on my right, please. It's extremely disrespectful to someone of Saviv's stature on stage. Silence there. If I could get you right there, you said only one Indian could have taken that catch. Today morning, Sunil Gavaskar was talking about Kapil Dev and said, with bat and ball, he could have won India a game. We've just heard the best say, on the field as well, there was one man who could have taken that catch of Sarviv, and that was Kapil Dev Nikhanj. But um, just maybe to, to elaborate a little bit on that as well, I remember whenever I go to India, people would remind you of the fact that um, what a magnificent catch uh, Kapil took. I was quite happy when uh, MS Dhoni won that final in Mumbai, because for some reason, the burden is off my back at this stage. <laughs> Okay, now to 279. Anyone? I mean, yes, 100 is 100, but 286 at that point in time was like a 400 total today. And the man who made sure that with Collis King, who was in supporting act, 130 plus, demolishing the England attack. And that, you know, Saviv, to see, to see highlights and to see your innings is the same. Because the whole innings is full of highlights. You torment the bowlers, you demolish them, you mentally disintegrate them. Talk to me about your batting philosophy and how you approach the game. Well, when you have an opportunity to, uh, to, to obviously engage against uh, your old colonial masters, <laughs> in, in my opinion, that was motivation enough. So, um, not trying to be rude or anything, but um, when you can um, get one over those individuals, to me, it's a huge plus. And uh, whenever we play against England, we all, you always want to give them plenty. Okay, okay. I mean, I've got to digest that, the colonial masters bit. But, but tell me, I mean, England was touted as one of the best teams of that era. You all had won 1975. Now, this is a story that Clive Lloyd tells me. You can corroborate. 1975, we've all watched the final, and we thought West Indies, Australia, what a great game. Tomo gets run out, West Indies wins. But is this true? I mean, if, you, if you've heard this as well, I mean, your skipper, Clive says against Pakistan, nine down, and his chartered accountant comes and tells him he's punted on, on the West Indies team, betted on the West Indies team, and Clive told the last pair that you remain out there, we win. And every over that you play, 14 overs left, every over that you play, I will drink a bottle of pale ale. So 14 overs, 14 bottles of pale ale. And by the end of the match, quote Clive Lloyd, he says, I was merry, West Indies had won the match, and I knew we were winning the tournament. I can't remember um, Clive saying that. What I can remember, Clive had his head in his hands for quite a long time, feeling that at any point we would have lost. 
But in the end, uh, I think uh, he gave some support in terms of the trust that he had in Derek Murray and uh, Andy Roberts, and they took us home. That was the hardest match that we ever played uh, against any team in 1975. It, it was that uh, Pakistani team who have always been a nuisance to us over the years. Coming to this World Cup, Saviv, I mean, 1975, 79, nobody thought we could win in 83. And it was a story of an underdog winning, changed world cricket. Everybody thought West Indies is the best team. You were but the best team. You came to India, beat us 5-0 that winter. Are you seeing any team which is even close to that West Indies side? Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes, Vivian Richards, Clive Lloyd, and then the bowlers? Any team which comes close to your team? Well, I can tell you, um, the team that's going to win the World Cup uh, this year, they're going to run pretty close because they've got the same physical look. And I can only speak of my West Indian team. Um, you actually believe and, they will win the World yeah, Cup? Yeah, and um, you can say that you heard it here. <laughs> that um, we are physically blessed, in a sense, in all various departments. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but at, the end of the, at the end of the day, in, when you look at the guys on the field itself, I saw them at Trent Bridge the other day. The physicality, it reminds me of a Joel Garner. It m reminds me of a Michael Holden. All the Andy Roberts, all those things that we had in the past. So this is why I think um, we have some explosive batsmen. And I think this year these guys are going to create their own legacy. Because um, what I saw at Trent Bridge against Pakistan, for some reason, I believe they can go all the way. Okay, let me ask you a West Indies question then. I mean, a couple of years back, the West Indies test team was playing in Australia and getting hammered. And the West Indies entertainers, Chris Gale and the rest of the lot, were playing the Big Bash League, entertaining the world. And, and we were all shocked to see the national team going down while these players playing the franchise leagues, making money, entertaining the world. What changed? How is it that all of a sudden, the Chris Gales of the world, Darren Bravo coming back, everybody coming together and West Indies fielding their best team yet again in the World Cup. What has happened under Jason Holder? What transformation happened? Well, before Jason Holder uh, obviously took charge in terms of what he could accomplish on the field, I know for sure we needed to get rid of an individual whom I felt was president of the West Indies Cricket Dave Board at the time. Oh, you said it. Um, I personally think he wasn't that good for for cricket in terms of administrative wise. Anyone who uh, fancies himself enough to, to speak the words that he's the face of West Indies cricket, he's telling lies somewhere. West Indies cricket, in my opinion, it's filled with faces. And the faces that would have given a Dave Cameron an opportunity wanting him to become president of the West Indies cricket board. Those are the faces of West Indies cricket not uh, Dave Cameron. So Viv, if you see the West Indies legacy, 75, 79, 83, 87, Clive Lloyd, Vivian Richards, even earlier, Frank Worrell, Garfield Sobers, it's about leadership. All of you were supreme leaders taking charge of extremely talented teams. How do you rate Jason Holder? Coming out of the University of West Indies, Cave Hill Campus, 2012 class, Jason Holder, Shea Hope, Kyle Hope, Shane and Gabriel, all of them are University of West Indies products. How do you see Jason Holder as leader? Well, he's done well. Um, early on in his career, I think he was a little naive, especially when you just come into a new job. Uh, when you've got to replace people like Clive Lloyd, um, Vivian Richards, that's no easy task. You, so at the end of the day, I, I believe that where he's at now, and especially all that they would have been through, there are times you need to go to some rough waters in order for you to get to uh, the very top. And I think that uh, they would have been through the worst. And this is why I think um, starting with the World Cup, winning that, then after that, India in the, in the Caribbean will take care of you there then, and vice versa, that continuation. It is all about that particular journey, and the journey is going to start with the World Cup. 2016 World T20, I mean, Carlos Brathwaite hitting those four sixes in Kolkata. Everybody thought Ben Stokes and England had closed it. 
Did you actually think, because I'm told Carlos Brathwaite has done this multiple times uh, while growing up in the Caribbean as a cricketer, did you have a hope that, yes, this match can still be won by the West Indies? 19 runs in, um, in an over. That's um, a huge task. Because what I think um, did happen in, in that final over, Ben Stokes, who was supposed to be the strongest mentally, I think he flopped his lines. Because, to be fair, he was trying to get the ball as full as possible. And if your mind is not ready for that, which means you're going to get it into areas where it wasn't comfortable for you as a bowler, and Carlos Batwitt took, took control and really took him down. But the amazing thing about it, when you look at the both individuals' careers, Carlos Batwitt, in my opinion, have gone down, and Ben Stokes have gone up. So um, it goes to show you that on that day, that was Carlos' time. Let me change track. I mean, when we see Virat Kohli bat, and you, you have spoken publicly about Virat Kohli, if there was an original cricketing royal, that's Sir Vivian Richards, do you see a little bit of you in Virat Kohli? His aggression, the way he walks out into the middle. Do you see an Indian version of Vivian Richards in Virat Kohli? Oh, Virat, um, I love guys like that because... Um, too many times you'll hear people speak about arrogance. It isn't arrogance, it's about believing in yourself. Um, if you uh, have the keys to your home, you know all the various routes to your home and the entrances. Virat knows that on a cricket field. And I did then, so which means that was my house. Now it is Virat's house. And that's the way it should be. So, Viv, how good is Virat Kohli? I mean, if we have to track a journey from the 1980s to 2019, Sir Vivian Richards, Sachin Tendulkar, Virat Kohli, what is so special about Virat Kohli as a batsman? How is he different? I mean, there are many good players around, Steve Smith, David Warner, Jason Roy, Johnny they all, they, all, they all bring their own style. Yeah. But I've always appreciated Indian batsmanship. I'll tell you why. You look at the height of maybe a Sonny Gavaskar. Give me, give, me give me a guess on how tall you think Sonny Gavaskar is. Would be. Five, four? Thank you. Um, Virat Kohli. Seven, five, seven, five, eight? Maybe a little shorter. <laughs> um, Sachin Tendulkar. Five, five and a half? Okay. In India, in my opinion, because of your passion for the game, normally you'll be saying to yourself, wow, great batsmanship. We have Sonny Gavaskar, Sachin Tendulkar, now we have Virat Kohli. All those fans in India would be hoping that their kids who were born later on in life would be five foot four or five foot three. <laughs> <laughs> because, in my opinion, those guys pack a punch. And even before that, Little Vishy, he was one of my favorites as well. Gundapa Vishwana. Absolutely. Zero and 137 in his debut test match broke that you know, record of Indians getting a debut 100, not scoring another 100, several before, including Lala Amarnath, broken by Gundapa Vishwanath, 1969. And not forgetting, not forgetting the Latchmans. These are yes. the tallest yes. guys. Raul Javid, the wall. But you didn't answer my question. Why is Virat Kohli special? What makes Virat Kohli... 23 hundreds in the last two years... Confidence. Confidence. He's blessed with that. You, you don't often... Um, you don't go and pray for that overnight. Either it's instilling you, or for some reason, you are born with that particular skill itself. Virat um, is a fighter. And I love... Uh, anyone who defends their teammate the way he does, that's what leadership is all about. And I think Virat has got... I, I'm, I, I just love to see the guy, you know. It's, it isn't arrogance. It's all about, I'm the man today, I believe in myself, and regardless... Which means, even though he has respect for what goes on around him, he fancies himself against anybody. And that's the way to think when you are competing. So, so if... If it's the World Cup semi-final or a World Cup final, which is perhaps the biggest occasion of a cricketer's life, so you mean to say, so greats will, will embrace that occasion and do things differently? Do you do it differently? The ones who are weak 
in the stomachs are the ones who would uh, not come to the top. Every great player look forward to being on the best stage. And every great player expect to come out smelling sweet. And this, and, you know, this, this is what it's all about. Um, it is an occasion. It's a once-in-a-lifetime occasion that you, you get once in a lifetime. You've got to make the best use of it. Some guys just appreciate being there. That's not enough. I want to come away with the cup. That's the thought. And that's what I think Virat Kohli has today. Do you think this Indian team has it in them to win it here on 14 July? Well, um, maybe you may compete as hard as anything this time, but... Um, I believe that we, we have got a unit, and I say that WI, the Windies, we have got a unit. We're going to push all the teams all the way. I mean, I, I, I love the nationalism, but if, okay, fair enough. Let's do, it, let's do it this way. Do you see India alongside the West Indies in the final? That do we have the team? That would be nice, but I think India would have to play for, to, to do that and play at their very best. Because you're away from home now. I remember last year's championships trophy, if I'm correct in saying. Champions um, League, it's, that's what you call it. Um, you took out Pakistan pretty early. Then Pakistan came back and beat you in the final. So it goes to show you that regardless of whatever form that you show early on, you've got to finish that. Okay. So we have been talking about batsmen, we've spoken about you, we've spoken about Virat, coming to the bowlers. I mean, do you think bowling skill, I mean, we were talking about this Sachin Tendulkar facing Wasim Akram. Do you think bowling skill in general has gone down? Or do you think the Jaspreet Bumras of the world are right up there with the very best in the world, whoever bowled at your, your time? The only thing that I am a little bit disappointed with is the organizers of the game itself that... Um, they sometimes make bowlers look silly. And when I say make them look silly, because of the short boundaries. Especially with the explosiveness of the bats today. I think you need to, to give these bowlers an opportunity that when a batsman do make a mistake, then he pays for it. But in the modern day, you cannot work on 60-yard boundaries, 65-yard boundaries. That, to me, is making a, a, a bowler look very silly. They need more opportunities in order for them to fulfill their skills. You know, in, 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 in your time, when you have a bowling unit, Marshall, Roberts, Garner, Holding, all your captain needs to do is throw the ball and say, go do the job. But now, I mean, when you talk about leadership, how important is leadership in this World Cup, in the context of this World Cup, given all of the teams, the way they're shaping up? But what I think is so important now is that um, what is of great help to the captains, regardless of who, whatever team that you play for, is that uh, all the players would have been very professional in terms of the leagues that they would have played around the world. That gives each and every player an opportunity for them to uh, bring whatever advice to the party. So the captain is not basically just doing it by himself. He has other inputs from all the guys who would have been successful at whatever level around the world. So it creates that sort of uh, vacuum where there's a lot of information for any captain to work with. So say for example Rohit Sharma who's won the IPL multiple times, MS Dhoni who's won the IPL multiple times, that you think is going to be a major help for Virat Kohli? That experience is always of great help. And for West Indies um, we have people like uh, uh, Mr. Um, who, who it is? Russell, Chris Gale, Chris Gale. Andre Russell. All these guys would have been successful. So I think the West Indies team would also benefit from having winners in their team. So if you've done some coaching also. So I don't think this aspect has been touched upon today at all. I mean, in an Indian case, Ravi Shastri, Virat Kohli combination, the two uh, we know have tremendous respect for each other as a pair. And, 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 and that sort of helps Virat Kohli uh, to a large extent. Floyd Reefer, I don't know how many of this audience knows, Floyd Reefer coaching the West Indies. What cricketing pedigree? What is the role of the coach? How important is the role of the coach at this level, at, you know, in a, in a World Cup like this? Well, he's pretty new at the job. But what I think is so important that most of the players that he has around him now 
are people that he would have coached at the university. Uh, Shai Hope, uh, Jason Holder, and all these guys coming to, to, to your thoughts. Uh, having these individuals who he would have worked with for a number of years, that would be of great help to him when they get out into the middle. So I believe that um, it's a plus plus uh, in, in that particular situation. Okay, now coming back to you. When you walk out in a World Cup final, 79, 83, what is the batting philosophy, sir? I mean, uh, yes, you've got to win the match, but I mean, if I talk to any Indian cricketer, 33, five boundaries, there is a, there's a kind of domination you have. I mean, 136, 138. Can you tell me about your batting philosophy and how you approach batsmanship? Well, I post batsmanship in a very simple way. Sometimes I hardly watch what's going on in the middle. I'll maybe watch the first few deliveries and I'll have a fair idea what it's all about. Then I'll go into my, um, my bunk, have a little sleep, and then I'll ask maybe the point man that uh, anything happens out there, you just come and give me a tap. Because there are times when other guys get out and they're coming towards you. They're telling you all sorts of things that are going on out there. Things that you never see or hear about. So most times, you want to go on your own advice. It may sound a little bit arrogant, but um, it's of great help to you, personally. Did people sledge you? Oh yeah, you get, um, you, you get sledge from... Uh, the Australians were the naughtiest when it comes to sledging. And um, beating Australia was always one of the biggest accomplishments. Because to me, um, they are some of the toughest competitors. And whenever you get one over these guys, man, and not, they sometimes, uh, even though they're highly competitive guys, they're not all time the best losers. <laughs> okay. So, so there, are, there, are, there are two kinds of people. Uh, say one, uh, Wasim Akram and Sachin Tendulkar were there before you. And, and Wasim said, if you sledge Sachin, after a point you realize it actually motivates him. So the best thing is to leave him alone. In your case, what was it like? I mean, if somebody came and, came and said something to you and was chirping at you, would you feel motivated? Would you want to give it back to him? How would you react? Oh, man, I'm confrontational when it comes to that. <laughs> Very much confrontational because I'm a competitor. I like to compete. And I can remember uh, one situation. I was in a county match. And uh, for some reason, I had a bad night out. Uh, I was spending some time with Ian Botham. And we all know he loved a lot of liquid stuff. <laughs> Had a bad night, bad morning as well. Was thinking about not playing the match we were supposed to play against uh, this team. And I had forgotten the team that we were supposed to play against. That's how bad it became. <laughs> and I was thinking whether or not I should um, take it upon myself to go out the next morning to play because it's going to be a huge embarrassment. So I'm thinking about it, and when you would have been drinking with Ian Botham the night before, and he can make it on the pitch, and you don't, which means it's something you're going to live with for the rest of your life. So I decided I was going to limp out there, even though I wasn't seen as well as I should. And we lost the early wicket, I think it was against Glamorgan. And as I walked in, I could see the guys, you know, I'm a dark guy, and I was looking rather pale. <laughs> and as I walked out, one of the guys said to me, Hey, Viv, man, you're not looking too good today. Um, is all well? Couldn't even answer. Didn't have the energy to answer back. <laughs> Got to the crease, took my, um, took my guard. And it took me a little while, because when you would have had the night that we had before, you cannot see straight. And I finally got my guard, and while I'm there, the bowler, he ran up the first three deliveries. He said to me, hey, Viv Man, you know what color it is? Because I didn't see none of the deliveries. And he said, you know what color it is, man, Viv? It's red, it's round, it's five on whatever ounces. And when you are a competitor, wow, that's the sort of stuff you want to hear. So I looked back at him, and all of a sudden, I became sober. Yeah. 
he went back to his mark, and maybe because of what he felt the first three deliveries, he came a little straighter and a little fuller. And I can remember, I just closed my eyes and smacked this thing. And from the feeling and the sound, you know, it was bingo. <laughs> and this thing just sailed. And the Somerset Cricket Ground itself, there's a little river that runs to the back of it. And there were two guys every afternoon would do two little casual fishing. And this ball landed in this dinghy. Bang! And these guys were saying, everyone's looking and thinking, well, Jesus Christ, what's happening here? The folks who were at the top of the stand looked to these guys in the dinghy and said, can we have the ball back? And there was some rude language like, um, bleep, you guys can bleep off because it is the first catch we have had all day. <laughs> but I'm not finished, I'm not finished. Normally, when you have aggressive bowlers like that, and now you are in a win-win situa win situation as a batsman, he's trying to get out of my eyesight now. Remember I told you earlier on that I was a little confrontational. So I'm walking back to him to his mark. He doesn't want to see me in that, look me in the eyes anymore. And I said, hey, Greg. And he looked around. I said, seeing you know what color, shape, and size, go and help them find it. Wow, OK. The story goes that when Savev played, The, 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 the two guys who were there in that dinghy, in fact, it had become tradition that they would retrieve the balls from there, get it back, and make a wage. When Saviv played, that had become the pattern because 90 times out of 100, several balls would land in that, in that river each time he batted. So you can go and check that story. Okay. Saviv, coming back to the World Cup. Winner in 75, winner in 79, runner-up in 83. Is that team, the 83 team, the 79 team, and the test team, the greatest team to have played cricket of all time? No, I don't think so. Um, I'll never look at it that way. Uh, I guess there's so many teams that would have been assembled before that uh, are, are great teams. but. Um, what we had then, we were quite privileged because of our physicality. Um, we did believe. We, we had um, a lot of guys who were total professionals who were playing county cricket. That would, would be of enormous help for you as a team itself. And we had a great leader in Clive Lloyd. Clive Lloyd, um, laid back, uh, used to call him the super cat. You know, laid back sort of guy. And I had an, an enormous amount of respect for, for Clive Lloyd. And when you have respect for your captain, it's amazing the things you as a person can accomplish. And I was just happy to have him around. And, but I will never ever put us in the category of um, being the greatest whatever team ever, but to, to let the pundits um, make that decision. Clive Lloyd, uh, you know, the, the fact that you said that you can accomplish a lot when you have respect for your leader. Malcolm Marshall with a broken hand going out to bat for Clive Lloyd, picking up multiple wickets. I mean, these are part of cricketing folklore. I mean, what is it? What is so special or was so special about Clive Lloyd that all of you looked up to him and, and, and he was able... To, because Vivian Richards, I mean, you said you're confrontational. Obviously, you can't be easy to deal with. You're a superstar. Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes, Larry Gomes, Malcolm Marshall, Joel Garner, Andy Rock. Not easy people, each a superstar in his own right. Clive Lloyd, how did Clive Lloyd manage you guys in the dressing room? What I think was of um, great importance, when we all toured, I made my first tour to India in 1974. And on the Clive Lloyd, I was a rookie then. Uh, all the guys, Alvin Kali Sharan, Gordon Greenwich, everyone was pretty young then. And it sometimes uh, baffles me because of the success that he would have had, uh, there are some folks who felt that Clive Lloyd, because he had a great team, he, he, there wasn't anything that he needed to do. But um, we, never, we never started as superstars. 
we, 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 we started like everyone else. And in order for us to have grown, there must have been someone at the helm who was pretty supportive of what he was trying to accomplish. And the players themselves, who was captain at that particular time in Clive Lloyd, we had respect for him. And this is what it's all about. Anything that he ordered is like the sergeant major. That, to me, was the, the platform that we needed for us to accomplish the things that we did in, uh, in, in, in latter life. So we have touched upon respect. And this is something I want to ask you about. You know, in, in this sport that we play, it is always about respect. But oftentimes, unfair criticism come people's way. We in India, for example, a year back, not now, a year back when MS Thoni wasn't scoring runs, there was a lot of criticism that came MS Thoni's way. The thing that amazed me about um, in India at times, uh, I think you, you lack a little, your fans lack a little patience at times. Uh, I, for guys, and sometimes uh, I find it, it is so unreasonable that guys, you know, who would have given their heart and souls for, for Indian cricket and would have made Indian cricket the success that it is today. Sometimes, not all the time you're going to win, but you have a little patience at times and when you start burning effigies and things like that, that to me is rather silly. You know, the guys, um, they, they, they don't go out there to lose. They go out there to give their, put their best foot forward. And people, our fans, should be a little bit more respectful at times. That is not all the time that you can win. But there's the other side to it as well. I mean, we Indians, we overreact, yes. But while we fans burn effigies, I mean, in, 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 in defense of the fans, when the players go out there and win a World Cup, they are worshipped as gods. I tell, and this is how it should be. Um, you shouldn't be able to be hero today and zero tomorrow. And too many times I see that. Okay. Because so, we had the same thing too in the Caribbean. Exactly, exactly. When we, when we lost to India in that eight, 1983 final, everyone thought that we were invincible. And for, for some reason, India done us. Sometimes the mighty falls. The mighty falls. Uh, who it was um, David slain Goliath. We've heard these things in the biblical stories and things like that. So let us uh, just you know, have a little bit more respect at times for individuals. It's not all the time that um, you're going to get it done. But to me, where Indian cricket is today, it's come a long, long way. And it's because of those individuals whose effigies at times you would have burnt. True. For example, when Sachin Tendulkar got, got bold in the 2007 World Cup in the Caribbean, his house was attacked, and thereafter he had some of his best years. After that call that he mentioned, you made that call. 2010, he was ICC Cricketer of the Year. So it's happened. But that MS Tony specific question, if I can ask you, you've been there, done that, let the West Indies team, how do you see his role supporting Virat Kohli as somebody who has led the team in the past and also as player, as part of this Indian team? I've always um, had a great um, respect for, for Ravi playing against him. And Dhoni? And uh, MS Dhoni as well. Um, these guys have done remarkably well for, your, for their countries. Because when you look and see where India is today, uh, in terms of his fast bowling unit as well, there must have been something which was planned along the way for you to have the people like uh, Bumra, who I think um, is a dangerous sort of uh, an opponent. The best in the world? Uh, man. With that kind of a style and action, man, he'll hurt a few. You know, he's a very good uh, individual. And now, the Indian attack over the years used to be of spin. And now, you have sometimes the most aggressive attack. What you've done to Australia, in my opinion, that's legendary. To see the Australians taking it in their backyard was so wonderful to see, man. <laughs> Love you for this. To finish off, we've got about three minutes left. Coming back to the West Indies. You beat England in, Engl England in a test series earlier this year. I don't think anybody in this audience would have given the West Indies team a chance to beat England in a test series. It was achieved. It was achieved. For the first time, you're putting your best team out there on the park. You've beaten Pakistan hands down. But is there a question of consistency? Will you score 400 one day and 120 the other day? 
You know, when you, you speak about um, the way you beat England in the series in the Caribbean, I, I was probably um, witness to that because I was at home at the same time. Uh, whenever the English cricket team at some point get beats, they always have to have some sort of a weak excuse, in my opinion. <laughs> and when I say weak excuse, they came to the Caribbean with their bloody tails up thinking that uh, the things that they did achieve against the West Indies, it was just for them to turn up. And they came up against a team that was pretty much resilient and for some reason found a format that would have given England a lot of trouble over the years in those four big, strong quicks. And we gave it to them and they didn't quite handle it as well as they should. West Indies played magnificently well. So forget the excuses, boys. So consistency, is that an issue? Uh, this World Cup, is consistency still an issue? Yes, Shane and Gabriel was brilliant. Yes, Kimar Roach is great. But can you do it nine matches? Can you do it in the knockouts? Can you go the distance? Well, I think um, this World Cup will prove whether or not we have the substance to go all the way. But the way in which we started against Pakistan, that's great. We now have Australia. I'm going to take a little look and see how we handle Australia first. And if we stick it up their noses, I'll say we are going to go all the way. Okay. My time's almost up. So we have last couple of questions to you. Question one, your favorite World Cup moment. You've won it multiple times. You've been the best batsman for a long, long time. The Cricketing Royal, as I call you, your favorite World Cup moment. <laughs> um, my favorite World Cup moment, uh, when we won it for the very first time in 1975, it was the first time uh, I think the World Cup would have been played. And um, I was picked as a batsman, and then I turned it around with three runouts. So that to me was my favorite uh, moment because of the fact that I, I was picked the bats and failed with the bats, but for some reason, when you win things, you want to know that you would have played a part. And to have run these three guys out, playing a part in that, I felt pretty special. Okay, second question. The most difficult bowler you've encountered in your career? Man, um, he's out of India. A guy who suffered from polio. Ah, okay. Okay. Shanja Seka. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Six for 38 at the Oval, uh, 1971. He was coming out of nowhere. Bhagwat Chandra Shekhar, 242 wickets for India. One of the best you can ever see. Final question. If you've got to pick one star, batting star and bowling star of this World Cup. One. One batsman, one bowler. You're a hard task master, man. That's my job. <laughs> and confrontational you're, someone. You're a hard task master. I would have loved you to say in maybe the first two or three. Go for it. Go for <laughs> okay. it. Give me one, two, three. Um, I believe, uh, don't mind me going leaning, to, leaning towards the West Indies. Shall I? They say Please. charity begins at home. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so um, Mr. Puran. Nicholas Puran. Puran, I think yeah. uh, he's going to be a star in the making. Another, Hetmeyer, I think he's going to be a star in the making as well. And I also believe, uh, and my outside chances be the guy who I admire more than anything else as a batsman and his style is Mr. Kohli, Virat Kohli. Wow. I don't think we need to do more. Virat Kohli, Shimron Hetmeyer, interestingly, Nicholas Puran. If any of you watched the T10 League, some months back in October, in the Middle East, you will know why the legendary Sir Vivian Richards picked Nicholas Puran. Ladies and gentlemen. Um, the bowler that I would have picked, uh, especially One, two, three. if, the, if, the, if the, the conditions remain as in 1983, <laughs> Mr. Sandhu over there. <laughs> And you know why we lost that World Cup, batting second, is the fact that uh, conditions became a little hazy, and the Indian guys who wasn't as quick as the West Indian bowlers, the slower you bowl, 
you give it a chance to swing. And those guys um, swung it, and we didn't quite handle it as well as we should. So, Viv, taking a leaf out of your book, being a little confrontational, taking the liberty, the reason you lost that World Cup was because we were better. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll take that one on the chin. Uh, I said you were better on that day. Absolutely, agreed. <laughs> agreed. Okay, the three bowlers to close off the session. This World Cup, the three bowlers. bowlers. Uh, I see um, the young guy, Thomas, who would have just been man of the match against Pakistan because I think pace matters. Um, who else again? I think... Um, Bumra? For sure, as a pace man. And then if the Afghanistan team stays in the tournament long enough, Mr. Rashid Khan. <laughs> Nice. Love Saviv for saying Rashid Khan because of the story that Rashid Khan is. Ladies and gentlemen, 1975 World Cup winner, 1979 World Cup winner with a man of the match, 100. 1983, thank you Saviv for getting out on 33. Put your hands together for Sir Vivian Richards. India Today Group is proud to launch Arch Tuck 11, a fantasy cricket platform. It's a skill-based game which allows the fans to create a virtual team before every match. The ranking of the team depends on the on-field performances of the players selected by the fans. Opportunity for every fan to show their skill and win exciting prizes. Sir Vivian Richards to unveil with Supriya Prasad. Stuck 11, ladies and gentlemen, do try your hands. Do try your hands. Once again, Saviv, thank you very, very much for coming here. Absolute privilege. Thank you.